coming sorry it's late I had a I had an event another talk about uh, cop 26 you will who doesn't know what cop 26 is you all being yeah every news bulletin at the moment cop 26 this is the moment that we've got to avoid dangerous climate change and I'm going to tell you why it's all futile <laughs> uh, but we can do something about it so climate science human impact and future <coughs> world so I'm based at University of Exeter in the Al Simpson Institute which is um, the previously known as the Global Systems Institute at the University of Exeter. Um, this I've just curated slash thrown together because there's some uh, research that was published today actually, some really interesting stuff that's come out. So I've been updating some things. Uh, the first thing I need to uh, show you, you've probably seen some of this before. This is a, an interpretation of this, or rather this. You've all seen this, you know, warming stripes. Yeah. Uh, this shows the increase in the average surface temperature since about the 1850s and it gets redder over time. Well, this is a, a, a visualisation of this, which is the um, temperature record. So I do a lot of work with the Met Office. We have good relationships with the Met Office. Some, some people who work at the Global Systems Institute are also based at the Met Office. And this is the instrument record. It goes um, temperature anomalies compared to 1850 to 1900, so about the middle of the 19th century. Um, and it starts, um, you have to trust me, that it starts around 1850. And you can see over time, uh, it's getting warmer and warmer. So here we are in 2020, I think this is, where we have got uh, an increase of 1.2 degrees Celsius. Um, really, we should be taking the kind of decadal mean because you want to average out large scale fluctuations. Um, Notable fluctuation for this one here, this was 1998, this was a big El Nino year. El Nino is a global climate phenomenon where basically the Southern Pacific releases an awful lot of heat. Uh, for a while people were thinking, oh I know, so everyone stopped. Yay, because the temperature's gone down. But really it's just the natural variability in the climate system. You can see that we are continuing to warm. And you can see that in terms of the uh, record temperatures. The warmest years on record ever by humans in descending order, what this was 2016, 2020, 2019, 2017, 2015, 2018. It's inevitable at some point in the not too distant future, 2022, 20, 23, and so on and so forth, uh, because you know it's getting warmer. And that is a decadal trend. We've been warming since certainly uh, the 20th century. Right. Now, some people find it incredible that we have actually managed to change the climate of an entire planet. You know, human beings, we're only looking naked apes, we've only really had an industrial revolution for a couple of hundred years. So how can we affect the climate of the entire Earth, which is enormous? Well, there's an important perspective to take. It's about 200 miles up above the Earth's surface. We're in the orbit of the International Space Station. And if you look down, or rather across the Earth from this distance, you can see the atmosphere. And most of the uh, gases in the atmosphere are in the troposphere, the lower portions, and the troposphere is this, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of light blue colour here, yeah? It's a tiny film that covers the Earth. If the Earth was about the size of a football, then the thickness of the troposphere would be less than that of a postage stamp. So really our atmosphere is a very thin film that's been draped over the surface of the Earth, and it's the cumulative emissions, and our, also our land use change, which over centuries has affected the composition of the gases in that tiny film. Okay, bit of a revision. We did this at school, I'm sure, but let's go back. Uh, we're talking about the greenhouse gas effect. So why is it getting warmer? Well, it's because we've been increasing the greenhouse gas effect. Here we've got my cartoon, what I made myself with clip art, and I'm very proud of it. So every chance I get, I love to show people this. This yellow circle is the sun, of course. Um, here we've got the earth. Uh, and the atmosphere, not to scale. Obviously, you know, the atmosphere is much thinner, but you wouldn't be able to see anything if I made it uh, to scale. And the sun produces an awful lot of energy, uh, produces an awful lot of uh, okay. Sh um, short wave, low entropy, high um, density energy. The energy from the sun shoots out all into space, and some of that intersects um, the Earth. And it warms the Earth's surface, it warms the land, it warms the ocean, it also warms some of the gases here. And then uh, that heat radiates back out into space. Now, if we didn't have a greenhouse gas effect on the Earth's um, atmosphere, then 
the average temperature of the Earth would be much, much, much colder. We have a climate like the moon. So in direct sunlight on the moon, the temperatures get above 100 degrees Celsius. And when you're in the darkness, uh, in the shadow of a crater or something, you would get temperatures below 150 degrees Celsius. Right? So certainly the greenhouse gas effect on the Earth's climate makes uh, a very stable and pleasant place in which life can flourish. Uh, and that's because some of the energy that would otherwise um, get bounced out into space ends up being reflected back down, gets intercepted by greenhouse gas um, molecules, the most important ones being water vapour and then carbon dioxide. Well, what we've been doing is increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide. So this is not working very well. Um, I think I don't have line of sight to the laptop. I don't want to do the electricity next thing. Anyway, look, we've been increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in this atmosphere, so we've been thickening it and making it less transparent for this energy that would otherwise radiate back out of space. So by doing that, we are increasing the amount of energy which is coming back down, which then increases surface temperatures. So basically that's the greenhouse gas effect. Now, this is not a new idea. So a bit of, um, bit of history for us. Santa Aeneas, he was the first scientist who made the first prediction that if you increase or decrease greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you would have a change in the global climate. Uh, now this is in the end of the 19th century. He was interested in how to get ice ages, because at the time we were just realizing that on Earth's distant past, you know, 10, 20,000 years ago, uh, there would have been large scale changes to the climate. Um, and he was interested in, well, what happens if you decreased carbon dioxide, you would see a global cooling effect. He published a paper, it's a very famous paper, some people say it's one of the earliest climate uh, change science papers, in 1896, titled, On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature on the Ground. Carbonic acid was the name that used to, we used to call carbon dioxide. Is, and he possibly has got, um, got this question, is the mean temperature of the ground in any way influenced by the presence of heat absorbing gases in the atmosphere? Yes, it was hunting. Well done, you were very ahead of the game. But um, it was actually based on early work. So people talk about uh, Amos's work, but there are other important figures and other important work we need to um, cite here. 1827, so you know it earlier, Joseph Fiore. He describes what the greenhouse gas effect was, but in kind of very quite flowery language, language that you really quite, um, you have to unpick a little bit to actually get to what he's saying. But he's certainly talking about the greenhouse gas effect, why the Earth's climate seems to be much more warmer than it really kind of should be. Um, then we've got in 1856, a figure largely um, overlooked when we're writing the history of climate science. It's Eunice Foote. Here is a photo of her now. Independent scientist, social reformer, all round badass. And she actually was one of the first um, experimental demonstrations of the heat trapping properties of carbon dioxide. And then a bit later on, where is the laptop now? It's been moved. Do I need to? Okay. I'm going to get someone to do my slides. I'm sorry about this. It's not working. Or you could. Oh, right, here we go. Right, it's all coming now. Right, so John Tyndall, 1863, published a paper describing water vapour as greenhouse gas. We've got the Tyndall Centre, uh, internationally recognised centre of climate change. And then 1898, uh, Spencer, we talked about. Okay. Do I say next slide, please? Oh, this is exciting. Right. The power that I wield. Right, not yet. Wait for it. So, here we've got... Um, a visualization of the changes in carbon dioxide concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere over time. Right? It's called the Pump Handle video that I will show you. Um, next slide, please. And that will begin this video. Right, so on this axis, you've got points of uh, latitude on the Earth's surface. Here's the South Pole, that's the equator. Here we've got the North Pole. And on this axis here, we've got uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide. We measure it in parts per million. So it goes down to 310 all the way up to 415. These little dots here relate to these little dots over here. These are research stations and they're monitoring the concentrations of carbon dioxide. And this is the important one, this is Mauna Loa, this is on the top of an extinct volcano in Hawaii there, which since the 1950s actually has been measuring concentrations of carbon dioxide. Now, if the shadow were to move just down a fraction, there we go, that's good. You can see from January 1979, it was measuring 300, sorry, I don't know, <laughs> parts per million, right? That's what it was measuring in Mauna Loa. But you can see, as the years ago, no, uh, ticking by, concentrations are changing. 
You'll notice is the year, within the year, there are big variations. So you can see the, the concentrations go up and down a lot, and they're really going up in the high latitudes. There's not that much variation down here in the South Pole. The reason they're going up and down so much is if you think about the Earth, is the Earth's land surface. Think about where the equator is, about there. Most of the land mass of the Earth is to the north of the equator. So most of the terrestrial vegetation, the plants and trees, are to the north of the equator. So in the northern hemisphere summer, when the trees grow the leaves and the flowers bloom, they're sucking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the CO2 goes down. And then in the autumn and winter now, when they drop their leaves and all the vegetation dies back, they put that carbon dioxide back up into the atmosphere. So this up and down motion is literally the biosphere breathing in and breathing out. Now all things equal, the amount that it breathes in would be the same that it breathes out, but you can see it's not. There is this sinusoidal thing, this wiggly line, which is the angle signal. But you can see from 1980, there's a clearly increasing trend. And that increasing trend is because we are putting more carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere than the natural processes would be taking out. <coughs> now we've been measuring carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere since the late 1950s. And this curve is called the Keeling curve, named after Stephen Keeling, who was actually the first scientist to take those direct measurements. But we can be really clever, we can go back in time and reconstruct past concentrations of carbon dioxide using things called proxy records. The most important proxy records we've got are things like ice cores. So if you go to Greenland, if you go to Antarctica, you will see there are thick sheets of ice. And if you drill down into that ice, you can extract a core and find ice that was laid down many tens of thousands, maybe even over a million years old. There'll be tiny bubbles of air, and if you're very careful, you can extract that air. And when you do, you can find out how much CO2 is in the Earth's atmosphere. All the way before the process of industrialization. So when you do that, you work out pre-industrial periods of about 278 parts per million. And you can go back even further. Now these big changes here, these are the ice ages coming up. They are large changes in carbon dioxide concentrations, large changes in temperature and sea level. And the bottom of an ice age, we're seeing concentrations as low as 185 parts per million. So the take-home story from this video is there have been really big changes in CO2. And these changes, from this point to this point, that represents about 5 degrees Celsius difference in global temperature, which is enormous. Think about the amount of energy that involves. We've got sea level rises in the difference between this point and this point over 20 metres, maybe over 40 metres. These are vast differences in the climate. But they take a long time. We've got thousands, we've got tens of thousands of years to go from one point to another. What we've done since the process of industrialization is essentially instant. It's kind of like that in regards to the geological record. I did that one. I'm just checking. Right, so where has all that carbon come from? Basically this. Yes, there's land use change, there's deforestation, that's really important. But it's largely the story of fossil fuels. I'll go on next slide, please, because that one didn't work. <laughs> it's a lottery. Now, we know it's fossil fuels, because there's an isotopic signature of when you burn coal and oil and gas. Uh, so you can see it in the atmosphere, and you can see the stuff that comes out of the ground. There's also national figures, and there's back of the envelope kind of calculations. So these kind of data, they're quite robust. And this shows uh, the global carbon emissions by source in gigatons, that's billions of tons, from about the end of the 19th century <coughs> all the way up to about today. And you can see there is a significant fraction that's kind of gone up a bit and down a bit, which is land use change, largely deforestation, the conversion of forest to, let's say, agriculture and things like this. Coal was the thing that drove the Industrial Revolution initially, up to around the 20th century, and 20th century was the century of oil, and then we've got gas and others. So it's these emission sectors which has largely been driving the increase in concentrations of CO2. Next slide, please. So here's a visualisation of what that is doing in terms of temperature. So there is an average temperature. Again, this is an average not from the middle of the 19th but the 20th century. So this is an average temperature from about 1950. Right? And uh, if the map is dark blue, it's about two degrees cooler. And if it's bright red, it's about two degrees warmer than this kind of uh, mid-century average. And we're going to start this video uh, between 1880 and 1884. Next slide, please. And you will see that as the years tick by, the land surface is getting warmer. We are increasing the concentrations of carbon dioxide, we're increasing the greenhouse gas effect, we're trapping more heat in the lower portions of the Earth's surface, and things are getting warmer. 
Now, we have thus far probably increased the average surface temperature of the entire planet by about 1.2 degrees Celsius since the um, Industrial Revolution, since pre-industrial periods. But it's not uniform. It's a very, very patchy process. You'll see that most of the warming is happening up here. It's a process called Arctic amplification. Most of the warming up, up here. There are some regions in the Arctic within the Arctic Circle that are warming about four times faster than the global average. So it's a very, very kind of patchy process. So what does that temperature rise look like over geological context? Well, this, um, well, you know, uh, thank you. 20,000 years ago, uh, we're coming up the last ice age or the last glacial maximum. And you see the temperatures were kind of slowly going up, going up, going up, until around about, you know, um, 15, 15 to 10,000 years ago, where we entered this period, which is called the Holocene. So the Holocene is, or perhaps was, our most recent geological epoch. And we can see the Holocene has got very, very stable kind of temperatures. There was a longer term cooling trend. I mean, eventually we would have gone into another glacial maximum. Eventually this would have gone into a process of cooling, 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 and then we'd have another kind of ice age. Well, that would have been thousands and thousands of years into the future. What you can see, we've abruptly stopped that process. So within a couple of hundred years, we've stopped the process, uh, a climate process that's at least 15,000 years long. Now, one of the most amazing things that I learned um, was that our inputs of greenhouse gases and other land use changes basically stopped the next ice age. We're not going to have a next ice age because basically we've deferred it and delayed it indefinitely. But what's even more mind blowing is the ice ages, the cycle of the ice ages, glacial minimums and maximum, are about 2.6 million years old. And it could be the case that we've actually stopped that happening. So we basically derailed the climate process that's been running for over 2.6 million years in as little as two or three hundred years. That's the magnitude that we have on the planet. Oh, okay. We can see these magnitudes in real time, like within our own lifetimes. I'm not that old, and I'm not that old, but I'm a little old, right? So but maybe, how can I put this delicately? Maybe some of the audience here have personal experience of these things. Anyway, look, here are three photographs taken at the same place at the same time of year. This is up in Glacier Bay National Park in Alaska. 1941, the glacier comes all the way down. You can just see the edge here. 1950, it's retreated back there. 2004, it's here, and there's more recent photographs and it's further retreating back there. It's obvious, really, it's getting warmer, ice melts, right? There are about 200 reference glaciers around the world, and pretty much all of them are melting. Not all, there are some interesting kind of anomalies, but as the surface temperature is increasing, ice is beginning to melt, and it's also melting in the Arctic. Here we see coverage of Arctic sea ice. Now this is just extent. We're not even going to look at depth, which is actually more worrying to be honest, but let's just look at the surface area of Arctic sea ice. Um, we've got millions of kilometres squared, little as two, up to seven. I mean, we can start about 1980, oh, I think. No, can you hit the, I think this should be a video. I don't know, that, can you hit just the, yeah, yeah here we go. Right, you can see that there's a, a waxing and waning. There's a melting in the summer and there's a freezing in the winter, right? Because it gets very cold in the winter, but then it faces the sun in the summer. And so it goes up and down a lot, but you can see this is kind of longer term trend. It's going down this sort of jagged sawtooth uh, process. And yet at the same time, the thickness of the ice is getting much, much less. And the age of ice, some of the ice up in the Arctic would have been decades, if not centuries old. But now, most of the, uh, the vast majority of ice in the Arctic is now young ice. It can only be maybe a year or a couple of years old. Because it is melting, it's a process of um, probably unavoidable collapse or runaway process. Because as you expose more of the bright, um, as you melt more of the ice, you're going to expose more of the dark sea to the sun. That's going to increase temperatures, that's going to melt more ice, that's going to uh, further reduce the coverage of the Earth. So here we've got a reconstruction of what has been going on in the Arctic sea ice. This goes back um, to the year, let's say about um, 800, 700. The red line is the reconstruction and the shaded region is kind of um, where the variance is. We, we would be very certain that the actual boundary will be within these uh, areas and we think that's about the best estimate that we've got. And it goes up and down a lot, right? But here we've got modern observations. People have actually been uh, measuring it uh, for decades, and certainly the last few years there's been a number of satellites that are looking down and um, using radar telemetry and objects and pieces 
And you can see that when you put in the modern observations, that next slide, please, you will see that, <coughs> wait for it, <coughs> wait for it. But basically, the system is cut. It's probably undergone a tipping point. So it's a question of when, um, not if, we will have a summer in the Arctic when there is no um, sea ice. It will freeze back in the winter, but we're probably having that system entrained into an ice-free state, uh, certainly within this century. So it's gone over a tipping point. And there are a lot of these kind of tipping elements or tipping points in the climate system. Warming might be a kind of gradual process, but the climate system's response to it is not. It kind of undergoes these lurching points or these tipping points, which are very hard to recover. And once this is gone, it's not coming back. We have to see temperatures go much, much lower than they are today, maybe even below pre-industrial periods, in order to, to get that system to recover to the significant sea ice in the summer. Okay, let's have it. We did time. Right. <clears throat> So none of this is new. So what I'm going to do in this part is I'm going to talk about this parallel track. And what's this parallel universe in which there has been increasing scientific and political and industrial interest in this phenomena of climate change? Because the evidence has been building and building and building, and we have been talking about it for really quite some time. I could have begun in 1972 with the, you know, the, the first international conference on um, humanity's future, which is arguably one of the earliest representations or recognised acts <coughs> where politicians realise that we need a safe and stable climate and environment. But I'm going to jump towards 1988, and this is Jim Hansen. Um, he was then the director of the NASA Goddard uh, Institute for Space Studies, uh, which is a joint venture between NASA and Columbia University. And at the time, he was one of the leading climate scientists in the world. And he gave uh, what's now becoming a famous testimony where he basically says, look, we can see the Earth's climate is warming. We are pretty sure that the reason it's warming is because of us, because of our emissions of carbon dioxide. And when you look at warming continuing over the rest of the uh, 20th century and the 21st century, it's not going to be good because of all the kind of impacts that we might see. So that was his famous testimony in 1988. Uh, a few years later, oh, here we go, that's the Stockholm Conference in 72. A few years later, in um, Rio, 1992, um, does anybody remember the Rio Earth Summit, 92? Yeah. There was lots of optimism that the international leaders were, for the first time, going to recognise the need to limit global warming. And the only way you're going to limit global warming, really, or a necessary way, is you're going to curb the use of fossil fuels. So, that... <coughs> meeting produced a number of really, really important things. The, the Rio Declaration, which kind of enshrined sustainable development, in, is meant to in pretty much all government policies. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the big international organisation which, for example, runs things like COP, so COP26, and the Commission on Sustainable Development. So it's like an awakening moment for the international community. We've really got to get our act together. And one important outcome, specifically just on the climate, was some of the um, announcements and statements that were made or declarations. And this is worth uh, reading out. The ultimate objective is stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So dangerous. Right? And we're going to get back to that word. What does dangerous mean? But the notion is we are fiddling around, we're messing with an Earth system we don't really understand, and we know if we carry on, it's going to be bad. So what we've got to do, we've got to stabilise concentrations. And the only way we're going to stabilise concentrations is stop burning fossil fuels. So, made the headlines. Conference adopts Kyoto Protocol, right? We're going to do it. What did they propose? What did you see on me? We were, we were going to, in 1992, we were going to, by 2012, cut greenhouse gas um, emissions by 5.2%. That's what we said we were going to do in 1992. So in 1992, by 2012, total emissions will be 5%, seriously accurate, you know, 5.2%, not 5.1 or 5.3, but 5.2 of your percent lower than they are in 2012. Well, spoiler alert, that didn't happen. Um, why didn't it happen? Well, a number of reasons. Um, Al Gore, as you know, you know, inconvenient truth, long-term environmental champion, um, the Kyoto Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, was something of a personal triumph for him. He certainly had the support of Bill Clinton, but when it came to getting that agreement through the US Senate, it just died to death. And there's loads of politics around 
uh, this issue. There's loads of US politics you can look at, but basically the United States has and continues to be a very, very obstructive force when it comes to rapid decarbonisation. So it was never ratified, and without the United States, that, that protocol is never really going to have any uh, lasting impact. And we can see the kind of, uh, the number of different uh, international meetings and the impact they have had on, um, <laughs> on concentration. So this is concentrations of carbon dioxide, but this is how much CO2 is in the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason it's going up is because we're emitting more and more carbon dioxide. Here's a Rio summit in 92, and you can see COP1 was in Berlin in 1995, and here we are now at COP26 in Glasgow, and you can see lots and lots of international meetings, but really not having any impact on the thing that matters, the ability to slow down our use of fossil fuels. Um, right, so what does dangerous mean? How am I doing for time, by the way? How are we? It's 10 to 3, nearly, but I don't know when you started. I don't know either. You can't go any faster. You're doing your best. How, yeah. how, how, is, how is everyone? Are we all, are we all there? James, you've been going for 26 no, minutes and 10 20, seconds. That's not too long, is it? No. Can we hold on for a bit? Yeah. Good, because you want to do the end of the world before I finish. <laughs> right. So, what's dangerous climate change? Uh, this is something that has been subject to pointed and really very, very uh, controversial um, set of policies and discussions and meetings and, right? So what's dangerous climate change? Well, look, there are things we care about. Our ability to access water, potable water for drinking or agriculture, ecosystems to provide the services that we want, like coral reef that would be a fishery ground for species that we need, or bees pollinating our crops. Food, you know, we need a safe and stable climate which is grow our food. People live on coasts, sea level rise as a consequence of climate change is gonna affect them, but also health, we know the whole series of diseases will probably be made much, much worse if warming continues. So on the, this axis here, we've got from zero up to about five degrees Celsius, <coughs> what that would mean in terms of water, ecosystem, food. Well, and basically, the, the warmer it gets, the worse it gets. Right? And we go from nothing all the way to five. Why do we go to five? Well, there's two reasons. The first one is we think we won't see more than five degrees Celsius by the end of the century, or rather we'd have to be politically insane. Uh, and also, there's not really much point in putting on emission uh, warming beyond five or six because there isn't a global civilization there. There's really no one around to care about whether it's five degrees or six degrees Celsius of warming. Um, so, what the international community agreed is where is that line, right? Well, in 2009, whilst they were a tremendous disappointment, China and the United States just couldn't agree on what they're going to do in terms of rapid decarbonisation. It was important for agreeing that dangerous actually meant two degrees Celsius. So whatever we do, we've got to limit warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. It's a bit like a guardrail. There's a very jagged cliff, and you don't want to go beyond the guardrail because if you do, you might fall off the edge. Next slide, please. So what would that mean? Now I love these curves, right? They're my favourite. So what they show is in black um, the it's quite hard to see, but basically you've got, in black, is historic emissions, how much carbon we have actually emitted. Goes back to 1980, and here's 2020. And there's a different kind of line here. So these are like, um, this is like a mean estimate, but this is what we've done. And these different curves are the rate of decrease in our emissions such that we would limit warming to no more than two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, right? So you can see, if we'd done it, if we'd started 20 years ago, we would have to reduce our carbon emissions, which then would have been about 30 billion tonnes a year, by about 2% a year, and then we would have kind of gradually decarbonised society such that we would have reached this mythical net zero point, actually sometime in the middle of the, 20, um, the, 21st, the 22nd century, 2150, around about here, right? We would have had quite a long time to do it. Did that happen? No. <laughs> no, it didn't. Basin emissions gone up. So 20 years ago, they were about 30 billion tonnes. Now they are 40 billion tonnes, right? Because economic growth has been driving the increased use of coal, oil, and gas. So if we'd have um, started mitigation a couple of years ago, we'd have required a mitigation rate of 5% a year. Now that is really quite aggressive. When you look at the impacts that COVID had on the global economy, you know, we shuttered pretty much most of our industries. Um, we kind of turned off 
our fossil fuel civilization, that produced an annual decrease of something like five percent. So this is like a COVID, COVID response, uh, not just for a year or a few months, but basically for the rest of the century. That's what you would need in order to limit warming to no more than two degrees. What if we just carry on at constant emissions? Well, within about 10 years, um, you would need a rate of about 10%. And now this is coming to the point where you would really struggle to think how that would actually be achieved. Possibly, depending on how you do the maths, within about 10 years, or maybe even 12 years, that line is essentially it's like vertical. There is no budget there, basically. You would blame the budget. Okay, we're going to come back to these things in a bit. Next, oh no, no, not next slide. Right, okay, so that was uh, Copenhagen, 2009, what, 15, right? Whatever we do, we must limit warming for no more than two degrees Celsius, therefore we must undertake rapid decarbonisation. So what are we going to do? Let's carry on burning fossil fuels, right? So that's what happened to pot. Um, more recently, in 2015, the Paris, the Paris talks, major development, because then there's two reasons it was a major development. The first one is they actually said, no, look, dangerous isn't two degrees. Dangerous is well below two degrees. And that's commonly interpreted as 1.5 degrees Celsius. That was a tremendous victory for global developing South countries, <coughs> Bangladesh, Mauritius, um, any country that has a low line land mass, large coastal communities, and also not very industrialized, not very wealthy, so they're most vulnerable to climate change. Because they made the point, and the science was increasingly showing, that if you go below above 1.5, then some of those countries would literally disappear. They would just be swamped by sea level. And then you've got increasingly disruptive storms. So dangerous, if you're interested in the global formulation or definition of dangerous, is well below two degrees. That's about 1.5 degrees Celsius since pre industrial period. Okay, what does that look like? Well, the budget is much, much smaller, so you have to decarbonize much, much faster. Let's say we were started in 2000, 21 years ago, for that kind of 30 billion emissions a year. Now you've got to go not 2%, but about 4%. So that's harder, and you're gonna reach net zero around about the end of the century. Okay, much more aggressive, but you can kind of see how it's possible, right? Well, emissions didn't decrease, we've got another 10 million or so, so here we are now. Um, starting emissions two years ago would have required monumental, so this is approaching, you know, that, that's an annual decrease of over 10% a year, let's say. And basically, constant emissions within nine years, so basically constant emissions uh, now within about as little as seven years or so, basically there isn't any budget left. We've just blown the budget. We should have decarbonized years ago, but we didn't. We've left it, and the longer you leave it, the faster you need to decarbonize, the bigger the job that we've got. Okay. So just to put that into some kind of context, here we are in 1990. Um, these are global fossil fuel uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Back in 1990, about 1992, you know, um, the Earth's summer emissions were something like 22, 20, 23 billion tons a year, and you can see over the the kind of the lifetimes of the UNFCCC, the Conference of the Parties, the international treaties, really the only things that ever had any kind of impact on global emissions was the global financial crisis, and then a sharp recovery, and then the COVID-19 pandemic, and now a sharp recovery. This year, 2021, is gonna see the second largest rise in CO2 emissions ever recorded by humans, right? So pretty soon, we're gonna be at 2019 levels, and then we're gonna go above. There is some good news about land use change quite recently. I think we're going to get to that in the slide. But if you're interested in our collective response to the increasing sense of alarm that we need to rapidly decarbonize, then you're not going to get much optimism from that curve. At some point, it's got to come down. At some point, it needs to flatten off. We're not even actually flattening off. And we've got to bend that curve. And the longer we wait, the much, much faster and harder it's got to bend. Now, I want to show you these things because these have just been released today. I think these come from the Global Carbon Project. It's, um, it's a monumental task to work out where all the CO2 is coming from in the Earth's atmosphere, but you can see, this goes back to 1960, you can see the contribution to things like cement, from gas, from oil, from coal. Without like any chance of avoiding dangerous climate change, coal emissions have to come down. There's been some good news about the reduction of financing of coal, 
but there are still lots of thermal coal plants and they are still building lots of thermal coal plants. This number really needs to plummet. So an awful lot of COP26 is around coal. I don't know how optimistic I can be. Oh, sorry. Um, there is, okay, here we go. Look, I'll give you some cautious, cautious optimism, right? So this is, this is, make the most of this, it's as good as it gets, right? So um, there seems to be this unavoidable increase in global CO2 emissions from um, fossil fuels. But look, total CO2 emissions, total CO2 emissions, so this comes from not just coal, oil and gas, but also land use change, deforestation, habitat destruction, agriculture, things like this. Here is the um, empirical data or the historical data. And look, for the last 10 years or so, it's actually been remarkably flat. Now this is recent, I think it's the last few days that this, this data has been revived. Previously, it was a little bit higher. You could see that there was an increasing trend. It might not have been as, as aggressive as uh, the previous 20 year period, but it was still going up. But now they revised it, and they revised it, so it's essentially flat. And the reason they've done that is they, they're recalculating, reworking how you measure emissions from land use change. So that's actually can cautious optimism, right? Because it shows you that we do manage our land much better if we halt deforestation, if we row back on some of the destructive practices that we've got, that we could actually begin to bend this curve down even before we see large scale. Uh, reduction to things like coal use. And then if we do that at the same time, then we really might be able to bend that curve. So, is that actually the inflection point? Is this the final turn point? <coughs> Basically, that curve goes back about 300 years since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Are we now living in a moment where we're actually going to bend that curve? Well, if we don't, we're not in for a good future. Right. So basically, the headline figure, notwithstanding the change in land use, is that when you're interested in global warming, it will stop once we stop burning fossil fuels. It is that simple. All we've got to do, all we've got to do is stop burning coal, oil and gas. Coal, oil and gas that still provides 80% of all of humans' energy requirements globally. It is a tremendous amount of power and money and therefore also political power. So just to bring you back down to earth and depress you for a bit in the last part of what, where are we right now with regards to the amount of warming that we've already produced? Well, in terms of CO2 concentrations, they're highest for at least two million years, probably about three actually. You have to go about three million years to find CO2 um, concentrations as high as they are. We're seeing sea level rise uh, fastest rates at least 3,000 years, probably much longer, but we can't really have the data. Arctic sea ice is the lowest level in at least 1,000 years, and glacier retreat is unprecedented at least 2,000 years. You will probably now have to go back to one of those glacial, interglacial uh, periods, maybe 40,000 years ago, in order to find anything like the rate of change. And even then, it might actually be unprecedented. Uh, next slide, please. And that's producing some of the impacts that we see. Extreme heat, you know, um, deadly heat waves. We're seeing um, increasingly devastating storms. There is drought, which is affecting crop production in certain places. Uh, we're seeing, um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, and one of the themes of the book was about um, fire, wildfires. And every time I was trying to finish the book, there was another record-breaking wildfire somewhere in the world. And I gave up trying to capture them all. We just had to draw a, lumber, uh, draw a line under it, because um, wildfires are increasing. And warmer oceans and more acidic oceans, because oceans absorb carbon dioxide, are devastating coral reefs. We're going to lose all the coral reefs, sorry. That's, that's all I can say about that. Um, next slide, please. So, I'm just going to close out now with just reminding ourselves about where has this problem come from, um, um, perhaps to a certain extent, what can we do about it. It's a bit of a double-edged sword. There's courses of uh, hope and optimism, but there's maybe a bitter pill to swallow. So, some people here have seen this map, so I'm not giving it away. Um, what we've done here, we've scaled, resized the size of countries according to some measure, right? Um, according to some measure. So the bigger the country, uh, the larger the property it's got. So you can see the United States is quite large, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, China. So anyone, anybody want to have a guess about what the rescaling is here? Industrial revolution. Industrial revolution. Yes. Yeah, it's certainly related to the industrial revolution. 
Yes, so basically, pretty, <coughs> yes, pretty much, what it is, it's cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide, all right? Since, I think, uh, 19th century, I think that's what we're data for. So basically, the larger the country, the more carbon dioxide uh, that country has put into the Earth's atmosphere. And remember, it's not just the emissions that we put today, it's the emissions that we put two or three hundred years ago, because CO2 stays active in, in the atmosphere for many centuries, right? So this is the kind of the cumulative contribution to climate change. And you can see it's driven by the United Kingdom, European nations, the United States, increasingly China. But China still can't compete with the US when it comes to cumulative emissions, because the US has had such a longer head start. Note also, though, the countries you can't see, basically, these are the little sub-Saharan sub, sub, uh, African nations. You can barely see them. Also, some nations in Central and South America, because these nations haven't undertaken anything like the amount of industrialization and development that we have in the global north. Now we're going to do re another rescale. Now you can barely see the United Kingdom. The United States is a stick figure. Um, you can barely see any of Europe, actually. But now, look, it's African nations, to a certain extent, um, some countries in Asia, in particular India. What is the rescaling being used now? Anybody want to guess? The impact? Yes, yeah. So this is the change in, in standardised mortality rate as a consequence of climate change. So basically, this is the number of additional people who are dying each year as a consequence of the emissions that those countries put into the Earth's atmosphere. And they are dying through things like um, food insecurity, increased um, distribution, changes of diseases. So it's measurable now. So we can actually see the data now. So this is a famous Lancet report. This is back in 2009, I think it was. Thank you. 2009, right? And these impacts will only get worse as warming continues. I mean, it's that simple. So it shows the, you know, the central irony or the cruel irony that those most responsible for the problem are those least affected by it, yet those least responsible are the ones who are currently picking up the tab and will do so in the future. But it also means that these countries up here have the most to do, have the most agency and the most power and the ability to reduce their emissions. Common but differentiated responsibility is kind of baked into our international treaties around climate. And basically it says, look, these rich nations, yes, you did most of the problem, but you've also got most of the capability and capacity to act. We can't expect sub-Saharan African nations to undertake their kind of energy transition because they are still desperately needing more energy, more materials. They're still significant fractions of their population in poverty. Whereas it's us who've got the wealth, the expertise, the technology, and the infrastructure to actually lead the world into this sustainable transformation. Next slide, please. And just to put that, or maybe hammer that point home, when you're looking at the where the emissions are coming from. So often I get a question about population, but isn't the global population increasing? Yeah, it is. It's actually <coughs> slowing down. The global population is beginning to stabilise. But if you're interested in the impact on the climate, if you're impact, and measuring that impact in terms of climate change, it is the richest 10% of the global population that are responsible for almost half of all the greenhouse gas emissions. If you're looking at the poorest 50%, it's barely a tenth. There is a vast disparity in terms of our abilities and our opportunities to change the climate and also the impacts that we're having on it now. And essentially, the richest 10% and the, and then the next richest 10%, those emissions are largely coming from consumption. You know, we consume an awful lot of things. That requires an awful lot of energy, an awful lot of materials, and so it's no surprise that it's that 10% which is producing most of the problem. <coughs> next slide, please. Uh, I might skip over some of this bit. It's a bit of a pet topic of mine. It's about negative emissions, but I will just briefly say, I don't want to give too much away for a lecture I'm going to give this to some of my uh, students today. Um, if we're about historical emissions around about here, about 40 billion tonnes a year, and remember those mitigation curves, let's say we want to keep to 1.5, it's practically like vertical, nearly. How on earth can we have international leaders uh, arriving in Glasgow saying they're going to keep 1.5 alive? You know, well, it's our last best chance to limit warming to no more than 1.5. Well, the reason is, is because they've hatched a plan. And the plan is, yes, we'll decarbonise, but at some point, we'll actually undergo what we call negative emissions. At some point, around the middle of this century, we're going to work out how to remove significant amounts of carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere. When you do that, when you invoke future technologies that will remove carbon, you allow yourself a much, much slower progressive 
way of decarbonizing towards it. This one net zero means the net is about um, how much carbon you're going to put into the Earth's atmosphere, largely now, and then how much carbon you're going to remove from the Earth's atmosphere from the middle of the century. How are we going to do that? Well, negative emissions technologies, next slide please. All oh, right, so it could be low tech for trees, um, schemes on mass afforestation, so growing of trees, bioenergy or something, and it could be much, much higher tech, direct air capture that made the news a couple of weeks ago. Um, these kind of vast arrays of sort of air conditioning systems that suck in carbon dioxide, suck in air, strip out the carbon dioxide, and then we'll bury it deep, deep underground. And through that, we, or sorry, I don't mind me, I mean my kids, I mean my grandchildren and future generations, because it's them who's going to have to fix uh, these systems, going to have to actually implement them and run them for the rest of their lives and maybe for many centuries. Through that process, we'll actually be able to stabilize temperatures. Um, we are going to limit warming at 1.5. Even the most optimistic IPCC scenario will have us overshooting and then correcting. We're currently somewhere between two and a half and three, two and a half to three degrees. Depending on who you ask, some people are very pessimistic. They think we're going north of three to four. Certainly, we're not looking to stabilize temperatures here. We're looking at the future world and trying to bend that curve down. We're trying to bend the curve as quickly as we can to avoid this. Now, the more that we bend the curve, the more that we decarbonize, the more that we have to manage our, our land, we will be able to drag warming back down towards 1.5 by the end of the century. And everything is absolutely to play for. We don't give up once it's 1.5, 1.6. We don't give up at 2. We never give up at 3. Everything and anything that we can do is going to make a massive difference. And what is the difference between 2 degrees Celsius and 4 degrees Celsius of warming? You know, what is at play? Essentially, civilization. That's the, that's the headline here. You don't have 9, 10, 11 billion people alive at the end of this century with industrialized civilization if we've managed to warm the average surface temperature by 4 degrees Celsius. I don't want to paint too much of a dystopian picture for you, but what's left of humanity will be living in the high latitudes, Canada, Northern Europe, uh, and significant regions of the tropics. They will just literally be uninhabited. So that's what we are working to avoid. But in doing that, we can actually make the people's lives much, much better now. And that's also the win-wins that hopefully get into the QA. Um, next slide, please. I think that's all I'm going to bombard you with. Thank you very much for your patience, and I'll be very interested to hear your questions. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, please. Briefly at the end, you mentioned like low tech and high tech, like trees and carbon capture. Like, how do you see the balance of those two playing out in reality of where we need to go? Like, sort of going backwards and going forwards. Like. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of interest in something called BET, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. And I think we realized that could be quite a bad idea if you scale it up because of land use change. So now, um, Direct air capture seems to be exciting some people, but there are some quite, at the moment, some hard limits in terms of how much energy that requires. So if it was to have a significant impact, then you probably need as much energy that would be required for the electrification of the entire world's transport fleet. So it's an awful lot of um, energy. But the thing about carbon capture and storage is that you're really having to build something that's going to require a lot of materials, going to require a lot of energy, going to require an awful lot of money for no immediate benefit other than avoiding climate catastrophe or something. You know. So um, some of the direct air capture schemes, they will get the CO2 and they'll sell it to the drinks industry. Um, so there's also product for CO2, but the large scale deployment, the kind of geoengineering deployment of CO2 capture is only motivated to reduce um, concentration, so that will only happen with something like a carbon price. So it's a it's a debt, really. It's something that will need to be paid for. And that debt starts to be paid around about the middle of the century of current policies. Could you say a little bit more about the low-tech solution the trees? All oh, right, yeah. Well, it's not just planting trees. So one of the reasons VEX was, is a potentially bad idea is you've got the industrial-scale plantation of monocultures that would devastate biodiversity and take a lot of water. 
But then people have been arguing long after, I mean, this goes back to the 1970s and 60s and 50s, that all you've got to do is just let natural ecosystems recover. So nowadays we call it rewilding. So if you just retreat from those areas, and with a little bit of help, those systems can increase biodiversity, they can sequester carbon, you know, regulate soils, and you know. But it takes land, right? So what that means is that we probably have to undertake more concentrated farming in some places, um, and move people away from some rural environments, or at least significantly change world practices to essentially just let the land surface get back on it. So if you listen to some of the um, talks from E.O. Wilson, a US biologist and ecologist, he has plans for continental scale uh, rewilding. So seeing fractures in North America will just be left, you know, and turn back to prairie or you know, primary forest. And when you see those kind of numbers, you can see that's how you're going to really sequester a lot of carbon, which is arguably just letting the Earth system fix itself, rather than us kind of constantly try to tinker with it. And in farming economics, we used to talk about um, highland farming and lowland farming, mm -hmm. and less favoured areas, I think they called it. Um, the less favoured areas would be prime, um, a prime opportunity to do rewilding, tree planting, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't have to be a monoculture. Yes, yes. But, you know, there's an awful lot of financial incentives to still do upland farming on marginal lands. And so then that's almost a, like a cultural shift. You've got multi-generations of farming and there's an identity of farming with a particular place. And you're asking them to basically retreat from that and change the entire business practice, maybe even their societies and families. But mm -hmm. There are some really interesting examples of farmers who've done that. They've basically retreated and rewilded. Um, some really cool case studies. Do you have any questions? No, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I just want to give your opinion. What do you consider to be um, what could have the greatest impact um, of either behaviour change or activism in the community to oh. reverse the trend? Oh well, both really. Yeah. I think one of the mistakes that we've made is that we focused an awful lot on behavioural change, and so put the responsibility on individuals. So you know, you can't have a plastic straw and um, I don't know, whatever else we have to do. And yes, individually, it's all important. An individual will have to do those things. But collectively, there needs to be action, and an awful lot of action will need to be driven by governments. So we can't expect people right now to replace their gas-fired boilers with an um, air source or ground source heat pump, because they're just too expensive. But the amount of money we're looking at, okay, it's billions, but it's not that much. So with, with proper incentives, either economic incentives or legislation, we can see large-scale changes. So in terms of what we can do, certainly we can vote. And even when you, uh, whatever your thoughts about voting, you can still tell your elected representative, your MP, this is important. A number of MPs I meet and I just talk to them, and they go, well, it's never raised. You know, have their surgeries, they have their letters, and no one really talks to them about this is the primary concern they've got. It's usually about, you know, as the car parks or something. So, we can get much more involved in the democratic process, not just through voting. And then activism is really important. You know, organisations like XR, um, you know, Friends of the Earth, by meeting other people and collectively acting, then you can act, have a much more uh, larger impact. And also you can sustain that sense of engagement, because when you're on your own, you will just get burnt out, because nothing will change. But if you're working with other people, then you get a much more sense of uh, being empowered to affect the kind of change. Thank you. Yes? James, do you think that it might be possible that we can keep below the 1.5 degrees uh, of warming or heating without reducing consumption? Or do you think that we possibly do need to reduce consumption to achieve this? I don't think we would be able to limit warming to no more than 1.5 without reduced consumption in some parts. So that could be the richest nations. So that's, um, there's various names for it, power down scenario or a low power scenario. We mean, for example, the UK would reduce its total electricity demand. Um, which you can see it's kind of doing anyways, it's decoupling it, right? So we're using, we produce less carbon for all the electricity we produce, and we're using less energy because we've largely offshored, you know, we get things made in China or Bangladesh, you know, rather than UK factories. So for the richest nations, they could certainly reduce their consumption, and that would give more than enough space for the global developing nations to actually increase quite a lot. And arguably they need to increase because there's still a significant fraction of humanity that doesn't have enough to eat, that doesn't have access to electricity. So then we talk about redistribution really, 
more equitably sharing the finite resources of the Earth. He wants another one. Um, it's really to clarify my question because I didn't um, uh, clarify what I meant by consumption. Okay. Um, uh, you assumed it was energy consumption, but I'm thinking more in terms of total material consumption. I would certainly agree that it's material consumption. And given how much energy and carbon is embedded in all the things that we buy, you know, at the moment we don't really pay for that. It's really quite cheap. Um, but if, you, if there was a proper cost for carbon, lots of the things that we bought would become much, much more expensive. So in the absence of that, yes, reducing our consumption would be great. Um, shopping doesn't make you happy. More things don't make you happy. You're just after the next fix because there's some deep hole in your soul. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, yes, please. Um, uh, so um, it seems as if um, uh, you, you said uh, policymakers need to take leadership positions. They might have, they might be unfamiliar, they might be unfamiliar with how courageous they might need to be, um, mm -hmm. and um, that might be particularly true at local and regional level, where there's not a lot of understanding or lots of the detail. And so I wondered if you might have any ideas for any. Uh, easily digestible three-word slogans that such policymakers might adopt in order to get the message across. Well, here's, here's, uh, here's one, win, 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 right? Mm -hmm. So too often, certainly when you're working in regional or local government, it's, it's there's a trade-off between doing the things that are going to get you elected, which is putting in more parking spots or making parking cheaper, and then doing the things that you think are important, which is maybe reducing carbon emissions. Um, but there, there is, there are just win, win, wins. You know, if you were to properly... A contemporary example with insulation. If you were to properly insulate people's homes, yes, you would obviously reduce carbon emissions, but you would slash fuel poverty. I mean, so many people in the UK have to decide whether they're going to be cold or hungry. Right? Are they going to eat or are they going to heat their homes? Because the appalling performance of the UK housing stock is an absolute scandal and one that would, would produce so many other kind of co benefits. Reducing car use, he said, looking out of <laughs> constant stream of car. Reducing car use would slash air pollution, would improve um, people's um, health because of ambient air quality, but then also improve health with more active mobilities, um, quieter streets, safer streets, you know, reducing um, uh, collisions and fat fatalities and injuries. You know. There are so many things that will produce co-benefits or you know, win-wins that you don't have to frame it as like being an environmental champion or crusader. You find, you find the opportunities to just paint that really better, much more sustainable, livable town or city. And there are some really good um, councils and leaders in councils that actually do that. But it's really hard because, as you probably know, um, and I can speak um, as being a member of this demographic, you know, the vast majority of UK councils are white middle-aged men. They might have more hair than me, but they certainly look like me. Um, it's really homogenous group and they have a particular mindset and they, they're coming from a particular perspective about what constitutes growth, mm -hmm. right? So that, I mean, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes? I guess kind of off the back of the last question, so there wasn't an embedded price of carbon in the stuff that we buy. What do you think about um, guided by carbon taxation? So people get very, politicians particularly, get very worried about carbon taxation because if it's not done properly, it could be a very, very regressive tax because you've got some people who are, you know, just to the point of fuel poverty and then you increase the cost of gas for a tax and then, you know, they can't afford to heat their homes. Um, but there are much, much more progressive ways of doing it. We had, uh, there was a survey in the UK that was published just last month that looked at um, measures that could be taken in the UK and to what extent they are supported. And there was overwhelming support for really quite progressive measures such as, well, let's just tax frequent flyers more. You know, the vast majority of flights are taken by like 10% of the UK population. And of that, um, only about 3% um, are really responsible for an awful lot of the frequent flying. They can afford it. Most of that is just um, expensed. It's, it's business travel. You know, if you turn the screw on that, you actually start taking money and then what was really attractive about the proposition is you could use that money and then use it to offset fuel costs for those who are most fuel insecure, right? So on the one hand, you reduce your emissions this way and you're actually redistributing resources to those who are most vulnerable to climate change. You can do that in a country and you can certainly do that internationally. But the problem is it's going to be expensive and you are interfering with the lifestyles of probably the most influential and powerful people in any society. So it's no surprise it's been quite difficult to get through politically in lots of different countries. Although yeah, in France they are now taxing vehicles by weight, right? There's an SUV tax. So I mean, there's lots of different examples how it can be made to work. 
Yes, sorry. sorry. Um, there was a methane agreement that came on COP. I know we talked a lot about CO2. I was just wondering if you could comment on that and how you see methane's role in reducing potential heating. Yeah, so methane is really important because it's a much more potent greenhouse gas. But fortunately, it doesn't um, it doesn't linger in the in the atmosphere for longer. So I mean, in terms of its warming potential, it's still more it's still um, larger than CO two. The worrying thing about CO uh, methane is we're not really sure where it's coming from. <laughs> you imagine you think, well, where's it? and it's coming from gas wells. It's coming not just from agriculture. A lot of fossil fuel infrastructure seems to be leaking methane. So the good news is then, well, then we should be able to fix it. So that's an important part of international agreements. Um, it's going to be a bit expensive and it's going to require much more monitoring. Um, the harder nut to crack is probably the land use one and methane and um, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and things like this. I think there's still an awful lot of uncertainty about what the overall contribution to land use. So they've recently revised it and that's good. But you look at the error box, they're absolutely enormous, right? Um, so there needs to be more science, more monitoring, more detection, and then we need to think carefully about those enforcement mechanisms. And it's hard enough to get countries to agree to reduce CO2, and then when you're looking at diffuse methane emissions, then. But it's really important. When's coffee? Just, just go on. We ask questions. <laughs> <don't we? laughs> um, uh, is it time after 26 iterations that we just abandon the COP system and do oh. something different? Well, end on a bang, why don't you? Um, I have some friends or colleagues who think that the UNFCCC has become counterproductive. Um, I don't. I think these are really important events and they sh um, we can't get rid of them. We can't throw them away. Uh, we need to make them work better. How are we going to make them work better? Um, in some respects, it's not fair to pin the blame on cops, right? So I showed the graph and they had no impact, right? Um, the dysfunction runs deeper, really, and depends on how far you want to get into it. Maybe it's a pub conversation. Um, but, um, and also the role of academia in that. And I do think, actually, that academia has been part of this narrative. We've helped sustain a narrative, which is, don't worry, everything's under control, the grown-ups are, are in command, we've got this. Um, which is uh, an example being, you know, 1.5 is in reach, you know, less far, our last best chance. I just think that's just not true and it's disingenuous. So there's something to discuss there about the role of COP and how we set the narratives around climate change and our continual failure to act on it. Maybe that's the note to stop with. <laughs> oh, no, we've got the call. Last question. Oh, great. Um, something I used to, I mean, you said earlier, if there's warming beyond five degrees, there's no more civilization. What do you think is the mechanism whereby um, things getting a little bit warmer and a bit less food means the end of civilization? Oh, wow. Okay, well, this is really interesting because you won't really find any simulation or model, or not a lot of scientific output on that. We don't really have any models, air system models, that can look at what happens when we get to four degrees, yeah? So you kind of have to work backwards and you can do things such as what would be the regions of the Earth which would become uninhabitable. So there are places on Earth right now that have witnessed uh, extremes of heat and humidity which are lethal. So if you're outside in air-conditioned space, even if you're just sitting down, you would die in about an hour because you can't shed the heat anymore. Um, and those kind of um, areas are going to increase in size and also in frequency such that there will be regions that would just be literally uninhabitable um, unless you live underground or maybe in some air-conditioned space. But really, it's, it's, the, it's the social system disintegration that you're going to see. You'll probably see the greatest migration of humanity in all of human history. Hundreds of millions of people, maybe even over a billion people displaced from the coast, you know, where they're going to go. You've seen the response of the European Union or Europe to the migration crisis coming out of Africa. It's been to throw up razor wire and produce an awful lot of political instability. Then you've got fights over uh, resources, in particular water, conflicts happening. So it's a whole spectrum of kind of social, political, um, climate and, and arguably military conflict that when you look at, would probably spell the end of life as we know it. Um, but just in, in sheer kind of climate context, certainly beyond four degrees, um, in the absence of some kind of science fiction intervention, I can't really see how you could sustain a, a global population much beyond three billion people, right? 
So where have all the others gone? Well, they've, they've died in probably very horrible ways, not to put too fine a point on it. There you go. There's another thing <laughs> for the end of the But this is not preordained, and there is anything we can do about it. But I've just asked us to be critical about the idea that we're just going to save 1.5 with the widespread deployment of carbon. I think we need to do much more work now. The heavy lifting has to happen now. We can't just expect our kids to do it. So, um, uh, thank you for making that all incredibly clear. Um, I'm not sure I like what I saw, but it's information is power. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.